Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is done in heaven. We come humbly before your throne, seeking that your spirit would be with us, that it would minister to us, that it would teach us. We ask, Lord, for open ears and open hearts and clean minds, clean from the worries of the day, clean from the worries of the world. And we ask that you would prepare us in a way that we will see and hear and do those things that will be pleasing to thee and a preparation for those trials and tribulations to come. We ask a blessing on your speaker, Lord. We ask a blessing on your saints. And we ask it in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I find it so always um, a little disconcerting when you look up and there's no congregation. It is cameras and empty space. So I'm going to ask that you open your scriptures with me for the scripture reading. The scripture reading comes out of Alma chapter 16, verse 217. And I'll give you a second to find that. Verse 217 of Alma, chapter 16. And thus mercy can satisfy the demands of justice and encircle them in the arms of safety, while he that exercises no faith under repentance is exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice. 
Therefore, only unto him that has faith unto repentance is brought about the great and eternal plan of redemption. I hope all of you enjoyed your Independence Day celebration, or maybe we might call it in Great Britain the Rebels Day, because we rebelled. I'm going to give the people operating back there a moment to get ready for the um, presentation that I've put together. I think back on a sermon that Apostle Jim Rogers gave well, probably 15, 16 years ago, talking about the founding of this nation. Very patriotic sermon. I remember leaving there thinking how God had really moved in history. And as I Listen to the sharing this morning of my brother Rick Scott in Blue Springs at the sacrament service. The scripture that I shared with you a second ago out of Alma, he used in his sermon. And I thought, wow, that, that really fits what I want to talk about today. See, I have a belief founded in the scriptures that God is in charge and that throughout history, God has moved. He's done so allowing 
humans to exercise their agency freely, completely. But at no point has mankind's actions ever thwarted his plan, ever changed the course of where he was going. I think about the story of Joseph and how he was sold into slavery into Egypt and all the things that he went through there. Being a good servant, a good slave, he rose to positions of prominence only to be knocked back down into prison. Situations that were worse than where he was previous. And again, God working, putting him where he needed to be so that God could affect that historical need. So that when the famine came, the seven years of famine, Joseph was in a position that when his family needed help and the promise of God to keep the house of Israel, God kept his promise because God's in charge of history. And as Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God used for his good. And with that understanding, I see that history of moving. When you read through Revelations in chapter 12, it talks about the fact that there is a war going on. A war in heaven. And that war is occurring here on this earth. And God said that in this revelation that the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should Feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score years, one thousand two hundred and sixty years. And it goes on in that chapter to talk about this woman being the church. And so, as my brother talked about my love for history, I look at history through that lens, through the lens of what God has shared with us. And how, with Joseph and him being placed in a place in time, so that Israel could be saved. God prepared a place for his church to hide. And he prepared a place for it to come forth. I don't know if you've noticed the extra graphics today, tonight. I picked those out specifically for today. There's a program we can go to that we use and um, they had 4th of July graphics and I like those. Although I don't know that I liked it at 12.30 last night when my neighbors were still shooting off their fireworks. Um, at least they stopped by one o'clock and I was thankful for that. But I like fireworks. I just don't like spending money on fireworks. I like somebody else to spend money on fireworks and I like to watch their fireworks. I have a good friend who you all probably know, Darren Moore, who loves to shoot off fireworks. And he does it spectacularly. I really enjoy the displays I've watched over the years. I just can't bring myself to buy them. Because I just, I have a hard time with that. But I enjoy watching Darren do his. But we celebrate this day on the 4th. I always think it's interesting that if you learn a little bit about history, you'll find that that day really wasn't the day that was kind of picked out for that. There's a quote I'm looking for here. I'm get through all these notes. In June of 1776, a group of men had gathered together who had 
no legal authority to represent the colonies at that point. They were sent by the various colonies, but some of those colonies were meeting in legislatures that were not authorized, and that may not even been completely elected. But these legislatures in the different colonies sent different men to represent them. And they sent them with instructions. You need to understand that these representatives didn't go to vote however they chose to vote. They were selected to go and represent that colony and to speak for that colony. And they were sent with instructions as to what they were to share, how they were to vote. Some of them were sent with instructions that it was time to separate themselves from Great Britain, time to become an independent nation. Some of them were sent with explicit instructions not to do that, that they were not to do that. And in June of 1776, a man named by the last name of Lee stood up and gave a resolution called the Lee Resolution, which pretty much said that we need to separate ourselves from Great Britain. It's time. And there were people at that Second Continental Congress who didn't agree. And so from the early part of June, all the way through until the first of July, they questioned that situation. They took time to set the motion aside. They took time to meet as a group and talk about it, to argue about it. And finally, on July 2nd, 1776, they came to an agreement, a consensus. And there were some delegates who did not vote. Now, I want you to understand how voting worked. Just because you were a delegate didn't mean you got to vote. You as delegates from the colony of New York or from the colony of Massachusetts got together and met. And then however your group decided by majority, that's how you would use your one vote as a colony. So 13 colonies, 13 votes. Although there were a lot more men there than 13, that's how the vote works out. And on July 2nd, they took up Lee's resolution. And they agreed that it was time to separate themselves from Great Britain. They declared their independence. The question is one that was put forth. Because I want you to understand the thinking that these men had. They had come to the conclusion with a motto that was resounded throughout the American Revolu Revolution, that there is no king but King Jesus. They had decided that there should never be a king again, except for that one king, Jesus. And this is the resolution, pretty much, that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And on July 2nd, 1776, they passed that. John Adams, who was there, wrote to his wife, Abigail, this day is the most memorable in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. So on July 2nd, did you set off your fireworks and celebrate? No. See, we a lot always like to think about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And I'm going to tell you, it wasn't signed on July 4th. It was passed on July 4th. And during that June, Thomas Jefferson and four others had been writing and working on it putting this in and taking that out and reworking it. And then they brought it to the Continental Congress, who then discussed it and put in things and took things out and made it to how they wanted it. And on July 4th, they voted. 
for that Declaration of Independence. They had already declared themselves independent of Great Britain on July 2nd, but on July 4th, they agreed to this declaration. And some signed it that day, but it didn't need to be signed to be valid. The simple act of voting for it unanimously. There were some people who signed it as late as August, people who had not even been elected and present when it was passed. They asked for the privilege to be able to sign it. But I'd like to have them put up on the screen now, those 56 signers, and I'm going to read their names. I'm going to give you a chance to see them. I've searched out these signers of the Declaration. I'm waiting for him to get it. You ready? Okay. Jan John Hancock. John Hancock was a merchant, and he had served as president of the Continental Congress. You remember him because he was the first one to sign, and he signed so big. And there's questions about why. There's a lot of stories that are not proven. Francis Lewis, representative of New York. Joseph Hughes from New Jersey. He was a Quaker. Samuel Adams from Massachusetts. Roger Sherman from New Haven, Connecticut. He served on the Committee of Five with Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence. Lyman Hall, a clergyman from Georgia, also a physician. Carter Braxton of Virginia. William Williams, I like that name. Two first names or two last names, however you want to say it. He was from Connecticut. He was the son of a minister, and he had studied theology and graduated from Harvard. Robert Treat Payne, Massachusetts lawyer, later serves on the Massachusetts Supreme Court. William Packa, from Maryland, later becomes a United States federal judge. Elbridge Jerry. He's out of all the signers, the only one who actually ends up being buried in Washington, D.C. And we name a political activity after him called gerrymandering. Um, it's not necessarily a good thing. Matthew Thornton was Irish born, representative of New Hampshire. John Morton from the province of Pennsylvania. When Pennsylvania delegation met, there were only two originally, and he was the third one who shows up being sent, and he ends up breaking the tie, so that Pennsylvania ends up voting for the Declaration and for the Lee Amendment. Thomas Nelson, Jr., represented Virginia, later on becoming governor of Virginia. Button Gwinnett, British born from Georgia. Francis Lightfoot Lee of Virginia. Edward Rutledge from South Carolina. George White. He was a, from Virginia. He was a mentor to Thomas Jefferson, John Marshall, and Henry Clay, and other men who became American leaders and a professor and teacher of those men. Abraham Clark from New Jersey. George Ross. You might remember the name Betsy Ross. Yes, there's a connection. And he went to her home with Robert Morris and General Washington to ask her to create the first flag for the troops and the nation. And Betsy was related to him through her first husband. George Reed from Delaware. John Penn from North Carolina. 
James Smith from Pennsylvania. Benjamin Harris the fourth, I'm sorry, the fifth. Benjamin Harris the fifth from Virginia. You might recognize that name because he was the father and grandfather of two future presidents. James Wilson from, well, let me get the right location. I don't have down here where he's from. Benjamin Rush from Pennsylvania. John Hart from New Jersey. Charles Carroll. He was known as Charles Carroll of Carrollton, or Charles Carroll III, to distinguish him because he had relatives who were similarly named as he. He was from Maryland. He was the only Catholic that was there. Thomas McKean from Delaware. Lewis Morris from New York. Thomas Lynch, Jr from Virginia, George Taylor from Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania was known as an iron location and he was an iron master. Samuel Chase from Maryland. He was known as a firebrand because he really pushed the revolution. Philip Livingston from New York. Oliver Wolcott from Connecticut. John Knox Witherspoon from New Jersey. He's a Presbyterian minister. And he also helped be as president of the College of New Jersey, which is now known as Princeton University. William, Hoop, William Hooper from North Carolina. George Clymer from Pennsylvania. He, along with five others, signed both the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. Clymer was orphaned at the age of seven and was raised by an uncle. Richard Henry Lee from Virginia. He's the one who proposed the amendment or the motion to separate from Great Britain that was passed on July 2nd. Josiah Bartlett of New Hampshire. Robert Morris Jr. He was born in Liverpool, England. Caesar Rodney. of Delaware, Arthur Middleton of Charleston, South Carolina, William Whipple, Jr. of New Hampshire, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, probably listed as the most famous of, of those who signed the Declaration a man who was truly gifted by God with intellectual ability. Stephen Hopkins of Rhode Island. Richard Stockton he was also a brother-in-law to um, Benjamin Rush who I'd mentioned earlier. This is another unusual name Robert R. Livingston or Robert Robert Livingston of New York. He served on the Committee of Five to write the Declaration. Interestingly enough, New York had sent him there telling him to vote against independence, and yet he helped write the Declaration. Thomas Hayward, Jr. of South Carolina. Samuel Huntington of Connecticut. John Adams 
served as the first Vice President of the United States and later as President of the United States. At that time, the election occurred in the House of Electors or the College of Electors, and the person who got the most votes was President. The person who got the second most votes was Vice President, and he got the second most votes for President the first time, losing to George Washington. Thomas Stone from Maryland, Francis Hopkinson of Pennsylvania, George Walton of Georgia, William Ellery of Rhode Island, helping start what later became known as Brown University, and last, William Floyd of New York. Now, I went through that presentation and I looked at it probably 10, 20 times at this point. And I realized that I had failed one name. Anybody know what name I noticed? I'm looking at the audience that happens, the, the few people that happen to be here. Thomas Jefferson, thank you. Thomas Jefferson, and I looked at that and thought, how could I leave him off? But that's what ended up happening. When you look at the, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, I want you to understand that they were very intelligent men. They were very ethical. And honestly, they were religious. I know there are many who question whether they were religious or question whether they felt religious about what they were doing. But all of them were involved in their religious organizations. All of them were Protestant, except for one who was Catholic. But I want you to think about how God moves in history. Because this is what Thomas Jefferson wrote that they worked on and they agreed to. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and the law nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that we should declare the causes which impel them to separation. They didn't just declare that they were independent, they gave the reasons behind it. And before giving those reasons, they stated the basis for which those reasons stood upon. And I want you to understand that the basis of which they stand upon is the Word of God. In Genesis, it talks about how Satan came to the Lord and said, let me go and I will save everybody, but give me the glory. And I won't lose any of them, but I get the glory. He was saying to the Lord, I know best. I'm equal to you, God, in intellect. I'm equal to you in understanding, and my ways are better than your ways. And when he goes later in that chapter to Eve and tempts her, what he tells her is, if you eat of this, God's not going to punish you the way he says. You will just become his equal. The gospel of Jesus Christ is rests upon one thing, you choosing. You choosing on everything that you do, the agency of man. While Christ came to this earth and died for our sins, he gives you the opportunity to choose him, to accept whether you want that blessing or whether you know best. How do you want to stand? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
There's lots of discussion about where Thomas Jefferson pulled those three things, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And there's a lot of conversation about what the pursuit of happiness really means. In all honesty, my belief is that the pursuit of happiness means property. The ability to own and control your property, whether it be your land and your house, your car, the furniture, the right to own property, the right to own it without interference. And you take that away from a man and you'll find that they no longer can find happiness. I think that's why through the 20th century, that great argument that occurs is Karl Marx's ideas and thought processes are put into place in your countries like Russia. Understand Russia didn't have the pursuit of happiness before Karl Marx's ideas in communism took hold. They were serfs. They were owned by the Tsar. And they didn't have an understanding of pursuit of happiness. And so they didn't really lose anything because they didn't own it before. And that's why that argument within our time frame today is so important. Is do you own your property? Do you own yourself? Or are you the property of the government? That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of those governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these, of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Without this document, without this nation, the coming forth of the fullness of the gospel could not happen. And you need to understand that this nation didn't just pop into existence that back in the 1500s, when Martin Luther nailed on the, the church door 99 questions that he wanted answered, wanted to debate with the church, that Protestant Reformation occurs because God is planning, God is preparing for the return of his gospel. And in 1776, they said, We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general conference, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish con commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may do right. And for the support of this declaration with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. I want to take you back to that scripture I opened up with. Because I recognize that I have pledged my life, my fortune, my sacred honor to my Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I 
Alma 16, verse 217. And this mercy can satisfy the demands of justice and encircles them in the arms of safety, while he that exercises no faith under repentance is exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice. What's justice demand? Justice demands that I answer for my sins. Justice demands that my life be forfeited because of my sins. I've heard people say how harsh, how harsh is that of God to expect that? And it's a lack of the understanding of the totality of what God is calling us to. Why did God create us? What was the purpose in his creation of us? He created us so that we might be with him. We could never be his equal. That's not what he's saying but that we might enjoy communion with him continually. And nothing that is not perfect can stand in his presence. And my sin made me imperfect. Which meant that I could never return to my God. I could not fulfill that which I was created for. That's the demands of justice. Therefore, only unto him who has faith unto repentance is brought about the great and eternal plan of redemption. That which Satan wanted to argue about, in which Christ said, I will go, and all the glory be unto you, Father, and I will do it your way. That plan of redemption that says, Corwin, you get to choose. Faith unto repentance. Understand this conversation that I've heard so much within the theological realm of faith versus works. It's not even a conversation. Faith unto repentance, meaning that there is no faith unless you exercise repentance. When you come to understand who Jesus is, how do you not bow down in humility and say, forgive me? How do you not repent of those things that have separated you from God? I've not bought anything with that. I've just acknowledged who Jesus is truly acknowledged who he is. You cannot earn salvation. It is a gift freely given. But you have to accept that gift. Fully accept it. Intellectual understanding of who Jesus is and falling to your knees in repentance because you know who he is, are two different things. I can accept and say Jesus is the Son of God. I can intellectually say that and know it's true. It's been proven historically because he rose from the dead and we can show that. That's different than understanding and falling to your knees in repentance. And this repentance brings you to a new life. That's what Paul talked about it over and over. This new life that comes. And what is that new life? In the Gospels, Christ talks about that in the end, there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. I want you to ask yourself why. Why is there a resurrection of those who are justified and those who are not justified? Why are they both resurrected and given new bodies? There's a purpose behind what God is doing. He wants for this world in the physical form 
a life with him. He gives us resurrection, not because we're going to die and spiritually go to heaven and everything's going to be great. He gives us new bodies because he wants us in this world to live with him. As Adam and Eve walked in the garden, that we might also walk with God. I'm going to interrupt the gentleman in the back there, Michael. If you'll pull up on one of those, the church seal that has the church um, message. Esther may have to help you find it. The church is called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to all those who will listen. Agency, listen, or don't listen. That gospel that I've just talked about, faith under repentance, and to gather a people together who choose willingly to live one with another in the bonds of Christ. To love one another. The scripture that was read as a call to worship, I give unto you a new commandment, that you are to love one another as I love you. Christ didn't give that lightly. He called to us to build a city upon a hill, a place in this earth that's not just a refuge, but a light unto the world of how things should be. And it's not about taking care of my neighbor because somebody comes and reaches into my pocket and takes money out of my pocket and takes care of my neighbor for me. It's about me loving my neighbor so much that I care about what's going on in his life. It means you've got to get to know your neighbors and understand what's going on. It also means that it's not a socialist economy in which somebody plans it by fiat to everybody that's involved. It means that everybody thinks about what are their just wants and what are their needs. And that I don't go beyond what I actually just need. And I'm honest about what I need. But I answer that question to my God. I don't answer it for Kevin. I don't say to Kevin, this is what your needs are. I say to Corwin, what are your needs? And I answer that question honestly with my Lord. And then beyond my needs, I say, here, Lord, how do I use this for those that I love? Love thy neighbor. I know at this moment, in this country, there's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of conversation about, do we do this, do we do that? A lot of disagreement about what's being done here and there. How this county executive's done this and we don't like it, or that governor's done this and we don't like it, or why didn't they do more? We like what they're doing, we want more. But here's the call, saints. And those who are listening, I want you to hear the call clearly tonight. That is not my focus, and that should not be your focus. This relationship that I have come into with my Lord, faith under repentance, that I daily, minute by minute, re-examine myself, and how do I walk with God? And I'm going to tell you up front, you as a human being will fail if you attempt to do this by yourself. If you lean on yourself to do it, we will fail. Because it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit, God himself, 
that as I recognize my sins, those things that separate me, that God will pull me to a point where I can remove them from my life. So hear the call, the call to Jesus, because that is the focus of everything in my life. And when I sit down and I realize that I have failed to put that in focus, I'm embarrassed because I do know who he is. He is the king. No king, but King Jesus. Heavenly Father, for the healing and invigorating spirit that has been upon us this day, we are thankful. We are thankful, Lord, for the blessings of your mercy and grace in our unworthiness. We thank you for the preparation that was made by our dear brother, and we thank you for the abilities of those who have continue to spend their time giving us the abilities that we have to reach out to our remote listeners. We thank the Lord for yet another day, a day that we have strived to set aside to keep holy, and we ask a benediction upon this service and a parting blessing upon those who seek to do thy will. And we ask it in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I woke up this morning and was greeted by the sunrise.
enjoyed a simple meal and enjoyed a moment of peace and stillness. I stepped into my vehicle and joined a million others traveling to work today. And I arrived safely. I spent most of the day at my job doing the same familiar tasks that greet me every day. The work that provides for my needs. I took a walk in the park and received a smile from a stranger. I picked up a few groceries. I spoke with my parents. to someone a thousand miles away. I washed my clothing. I returned home. A very ordinary day. Everything I've experienced today could be considered unremarkable. But they are all profound blessings, the fingerprints of your hand. Help me to grasp the wonder in the small and the simple, to notice the miracles which surround me constantly, to see the beauty in the commonplace and take nothing for granted. Teach me to make gratitude a lifestyle, one which flows into love, rejoicing, and thankfulness every moment that I draw breath. <laughs>